please welcome Mauro Caldarara, a quantitative okay. research engineer at Citadel. All right. Thank you. So let me quickly, okay. All right. So um, let me quickly tell you up front what this talk is about and what my normal line of work is. I don't know when you read the quantitative traders perspective on Redis, if that means anything to any one of you. I work for a company that is a, a hedge fund. And quantitative trading basically means that in the specific division that I work in, there is nobody sitting down and making a decision manually. We only use statistical models to trade on the stock market. So that in general is a relatively data intense business. Uh, latency is often critical. Of course, you want to be up all the time and so on. So it's, it's a very technology heavy enterprise, this specific kind of, of trading. So let me see, where does the advance go here? The plus? Oh, OK. So you don't need to read all of this. I have to show this for legal reasons. Basically, what it says is whatever I say here is my personal opinion. It's not necessarily representative of what Citadel thinks or does. What is the main idea of this talk? Why would I say I bring a quantitative trader's perspective? How is that even different from what you guys all do on a day-to-day -day basis? I'll try to explain that to you in, by using a bunch of use cases and patterns that I see in my work and try to conclude from that how I think about Redis differently than what I would guess most of the community does. So of course, this comes with a caveat, right? What does unconventional mean? Many of you have used Redis for many different things. So what seems unconventional to me might not be unconventional to you at all. And looking at it from the angle that I'll present in the end might also not be foreign to you. I just have to say that up front, so in case you would be disappointed otherwise, right? So let me start with the very first use case for the, that I see in the line of my work. So for the rest of this talk, every time you see this little castle symbol, which is, uh, by the way, trademarked, um, you, you can assume that's a proprietary process of ours, something that is just part of the trading system that we have or some pipeline of, of data processing. And the Redis, of course, is just the normal Redis, but we only use Redis standalone for the course of this presentation. So one thing that we would do in trading is when the market opens, a little Prior to that, we crunch some data, and then we spin up a bunch of processes that produce data that we then ultimately use to trade. Often, these systems are a bit more complicated, so you have this need for interconnected processes. It's like multiple machines coordinating to, to make a trading decision. So it's a relatively natural thing to use Redis to coordinate these. A lot of people use proprietary interconnects, but unless you're super sensitive to latency, and when I say super sensitive, I mean people that can't even afford to run an operating system, they have to do stuff in hardware, then Redis is actually a very good solution to do this. How is this different from what you would do in a typical web application, though? So it turns out that for us, Redis is just part of the app. It's not a standalone service. We bring it up with the application when trading starts, and we tear it down. That implies a bunch of things, namely, for example, we don't care much about the persistency aspect. We handle redundancy at the client level. The Redis comes up and just goes away at the end of the trading. We don't really care about the data it's stored because we could just simply reproduce it. The clients themselves, they would coordinate via these Redis instances. They would say, oh, I'm storing that kind of data um, in this kind of format, at this kind of frequency. And so you can use the generic features of Redis to make this coordination. Imagine you would have to handle this coordination on your proprietary interconnect, right? Now you don't just open a TCP socket and have a message for, say, your market data. You also have to pass around metadata. You have to deal with all the failures. You have to deal with the failover if something happens. It all becomes very complicated. And Redis has, for many of these building blocks, very nice implementations that you're essentially free to use. Everything that is a bit more advanced, like sharding, or in our case, we send a lot of data, so we don't want to use classical replication. We want to use something more like rate. There's a mathematical method you can use for that. It's called erasure coding. So you can 
say, oh, I want to save this data m times, and out of these m, n blocks can fail. Like, normal Redis wouldn't do that, but if you own how you send the data around on this, you can just encode your data in such a way that when you lose a Redis, just one out of five, you still have all your data without replicating everything as a full copy. Similar to how RAID 6 would work, right? You can pull things like that. Load balancing, eviction handling, you can, a lot of that can be done just on the client side, in our use case, right? Because you don't care about the persistent state, really. It just comes up and goes down. Another thing that we would use is to use Redis for weakly synchronized volatile data. If you were to implement this, say, using a different technology like a file system, you would need to use a distributed file system. It's often very complicated to do that. Understanding the semantics is complicated. It gives you way more guarantees than Redis would typically, but you often don't need those. For example, distributed locking. If you only have one writer, you wouldn't typically care about these things, right? So a lot of these solutions that are specific to any kind of task like this are heavy-handed. With Redis, you have a very good understanding of what exactly happens. You just use the parts that are there. If there is something that you need to modify, you can actually modify it. So how would that work? You have a bunch of processes. They send data over. Instead of doing your proprietary interconnect to this, you just use a Redis. If you were to do that on a normal file system, you would instead use rsync. But then how do you deal with atomicity? What happens if somebody fails, and so on? In Redis, this is all very clear to handle. You can just use it as a toolbox for this, even though it wasn't probably designed to do that. It's flexible enough to handle that case as well. So the eventually consistent replication thing it works better if you only have one writer, but for us, that's often the case. We often have a read, we design our applications that you have a read once, a write once, read many application. This becomes pretty trivial. It's a very standard use case, and Redis will handle that very gracefully for you. If something fails, it just comes up again, it does the sync. It's really neat. It's also very lightweight, right? If you compare that to a, say, classical message bus, right? And, like, if you spin up, I, I probably shouldn't name anything specific, but often these message buses, they come with 20 processes. There is a watcher, there is a storage persister, there is a converter, and, and so on. It becomes complicated relatively quickly. Redis is very simple. You just have a master-slave replication, you're done. It's also very easy to understand. I think that's one of the great positive aspects. I'll come back to that later. We also use Redis to do unconventional stuff like a parameter server in machine learning training. So if you, those of you that know TensorFlow, if you have multiple GPUs training something, TensorFlow comes with a parameter server. But you don't necessarily want to implement everything in TensorFlow. It makes a bunch of assumptions. It itself is a very complicated piece of software. If all you need to do is to do computations in a distributed way, and then you aggregate your results, maybe using some math, you average something. Redis works actually pretty nicely. So these are your workers. You would spin up as many parameter servers as you need. It depends on your problem, whether this is even possible to do in multiple cases. But if you just have one, then you use one, right? It, think of any kind of map reduce like algorithm that you would do on big data, right? Redis can actually do the reduce step for you often. So, it works very well to coordinate these things. And one of the great aspects is that using the modules interface, you can do any sort of complicated math you would ever dream up. If you can express it in C or C++ or whatever you want to embed in a module, you could use, say, Redis Gears to do that in Python. If you have heavy-handed computation, C is your friend. Redis is written in C. The module API is C. It comes very naturally. right? You can, for example, often, an often seen building block in these uh, machine learning applications is you aggregate data, and then you want to compute the average. So you just send the vectors of data you want to average. That's a simple C call. It will be as fast as any machine can be. On this, you don't have any kind of overhead. There is no complicated serialization, deserialization, if you choose not to. That's actually one of the downsides, I personally think, in TensorFlow. In Redis, you own this whole thing, right? You choose how you send the data around. If you don't want to use Flatbuff, don't use Flatbuff. It's really very flexible in that sense. And with the modules, you can do arbitrarily complicated math. Now, this comes with a bit of a caveat. You don't want the heavy loading to be in your Redis that gets hit by all your nodes. You want the simple logic to be there, the reduction logic to be there. In a somewhat similar vein, we also have a fourth use case that, that we use. 
in, especially in machine learning training, you often have these data sets that are actually bigger than the local RAM. And many machine learning frameworks assume that everything is available to you in RAM. So that is a bit limiting, right? So these systems, they all hit some kind of comparably slow, large storage backend that is petabytes of data, right? So how could you possibly speed that up? Well, an easy trick that we found it works very nicely for us is you just embed a little Redis with each of your workers. So each worker, when it comes up, also spins up a little Redis. It doesn't cost much. Redis is a few kilobytes of, of resident size as you do this. These workers, they go to a central Redis, and they say, hey, I'm here. Um, can you give me an ID? Easy for Redis. Right? The central Redis will easily do that for you. So the clients then connect to that central Redis as well. They see who is around, and they agree on a way to shard. So you can use something like consistent hashing in agreement with the application that you're actually writing. Right? You can, if you own the sharding logic, you can choose what to put where. If you have stuff that you want to be co-located because you want to compute the average of it using a Redis module, you can choose to do so yourself. The other thing that is really nice about this is if anything fails, since it's only read-only data, and any Redis goes away, or your cluster grows, say you use spot instances in Amazon, grows and shrinks depending on the time of the day, right? It will just naturally accommodate this. If you don't get a cache hit, you hit the backend, you pass that onto the application, you create a copy in the cluster that is supposed to cache your data, and you move on. That's that. Right? It's a very simple way of using Redis, not as a service, but more as an API to your data, really. Right? It's a part of your application. So the clients would then first hit these Redises, make a best guess on you know, what is where, and try to see what is still available, and otherwise use the backend. So, the nice thing about this also is that if you think about a GPU doing a machine learning model, you have 500 megabytes and more that this thing consumes in life, right? It's a lot of data that a GPU can turn through. Now, with a bit of tuning, you can actually make Redis serve more data than that. And as soon as you reach that point, it doesn't matter how wide your thing goes, how many GPUs you have. It doesn't matter at all. It doesn't even matter how fast your back end is, because your front end will just scale horizontally. And you can use Redis as a very nice building block in such a system. This coordination via the centralized Redis, I mentioned that. Um, you would, as I said, the, the horizontal scalability is, is just coming from the fact that one Redis is stronger than one GPU. You have to do a little work to make that work, depending, but you normally can pull it off. There is actually a very nice thing that you can do in such a system, again, coming back to the modules. Some of these machine learning algorithms, they don't actually want to see the data. They want to see some aggregate form of the data, something like a histogram of the data. Right? So what you can do now is you can have Redis produce the histogram. And that makes a lot of sense, because the histogram is much smaller than the data. Redis has everything in RAM. It compresses this down to your histogram. You get a ton of histograms. You just add them up, and you're done. It gives a massive reduction in bandwidth that you consume in such a case, right? If your algorithm allows you to push some logic. But it's often possible, right? Many of these frameworks are written in C++. Just take that piece of code, you put it into a module, you design a little API, and Redis will do it for you. So what often happens internally and externally when I tell people how I use Redis, they go like, oh, but why do you use Redis for this? It wasn't designed for that. Also, there is this proprietary or, or custom solution for this. So most people don't really appreciate this, but the main reason why I use Redis is that I actually understand it. This, I, 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 it's often hard to stress that point enough. But when you look at these large-scale systems, it's highly unlikely that it does exactly what you want. So now you're looking at 500 megabytes of Scala code and the JVM and a ton of processes all around. I'd much rather look at Salvatore's code for an afternoon and find out what I need to change. It is, as an open source project, it's very accessible. The code is nice. You can dig in. You will find what you need quickly. It's actually very nice. And I think you, know, you can argue about design and, and things like that. But this is a huge benefit. For me, the feeling that I understand what's going on, I don't like these black box systems. That also implies that I can go in and modify, and I'll talk a bit about what we found that we had to modify on the next slide. So maybe as a takeaway or as a, as a kind of precursor to the takeaway, you can think of, or the way I think of Redis, it's a very nice box of solutions 
that you would often feel in distributed systems. And given the way it's architected, you just pick and choose what you want. Like, you implementing your own replication, that's actually not fun. Just use Redis for it, right? Redis has very nice replication. If, if you want to handle many clients and timeouts and the evictions, that's all there. You implementing a custom logic for a custom project, it's just not going to save you time. You can do that because it's very lightweight and fast. You don't need to call an admin to spin up a Redis. You can just do it yourself, right? You just bring it up. And you can customize it to your heart's content using modules. It's a great feature. It, we also find it useful in, in very distributed systems to just give everyone an ID and, and say, oh, who is where, or oh, this guy just died. That, that is the generic useful application for it as well. So what did we have to modify when I said the source code is accessible? Um, things that we did or found useful is ACLs. Um, luckily, we won't need to maintain a separate patch for this. Uh, I think I'm not jumping the ship here. This is official, right? That ACL, OK, good. So those are going to be available to everyone. I'm very happy I don't have to maintain a patch. The design that we had is very similar to, to what Salvatore had. Um, modules, we didn't really have modules in, in Redis 3, but we just implemented our custom commands in the C code. That was not too hard. I'm very happy to have the modules API now. It's much better than what we had. Um, there is one thing that, that we do. Redis is in many ways optimized for giving quick answers to small questions, right? You, you typically, it, it's not built internally to send around large amounts of data. Does this double buffering thing, um, it, it wouldn't ever save anything to disk to serve it. Uh, which, which makes a ton of sense. So we, we did a bunch of optimizations there. For example, we have a, an internal bulk type that uses a different allocator. Um, and then we use um, a special set of threads that just pump this to the client. Instead of the main loop inside Redis that just pumps a little bit to everyone, we have a set of threads that go and say, like, OK, here is a gigabyte of data. I need that to get, to get that to this client. Let me do this right now. We can do that because we often have a relatively low ratio of clients to Redis servers. So this design works just fine. But the main point here is that you can actually do it. Right? Imagine some of the other projects, you trying to pull this off. There are a bunch of other minor things that we, we change. For example, the, the way streams re return their replies is often very tedious to marshal data in because you get it row major. Often it would be way more convenient to get your reply column major. Um, because it's just easier to put into the ultimate storage format that the user that has. You can, you can implement things like that in a module. Um, one thing that we're considering is having Redis as an embedded thing. So imagine you could just do import Redis server and then start the Redis inside your process, and you can communicate with it without actually passing memory around. Right? You just pass pointers to the data. You don't go over a socket. This is actually a bit more work, and I'm not sure if we are ever going to do it, but given the usage pattern that we see, that is something that I was thinking about doing. So what is the main takeaway, or what would I hope would be the main takeaway? I feel that I think about Redis less as a service than as a protocol to access your data and the library of very nice things. It's to me, in some sense, closer to zero message queue than it is to MySQL, personally. I just, just the pattern that, that I see it used goes a bit more in that direction. And the reason why this is the case is that it is very lightweight. You can often, in our design, stay away from complicated architecture. You often don't need this very advanced complexity for what we do. And again, it is just great to work with if you're willing to dig into the source code and go like, OK, how is this implemented? How does that impact my performance? Is there something I can change? And often you can. right? You just look at how things are done. It's well documented. It's well easy to understand. It's not an opaque code base. And you just go and you adjust it to your needs. And that's it. <laughs>